ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له اله الاولين والاخرين واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله أرسله رحمة للعالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أو يه بليف بي مايكفل في الله اتقوا الله and speak sound words, good words. وَقُولُوا قَوْلًا سَدِيدًا يُصْلِحْ لَكُمْ أَعْمَالَكُمْ He'll correct your affairs for you, correct your actions for you, and forgive your sins for you. Correct your affairs means all affairs, worldly affairs and the affairs relating to the Akhir. وَمَنْ يُطْعِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ فَازَ فَوْزًا عَظِيمًا and whoever obeys Allah and His Messenger has <coughs> succeeded and, gra- and been granted a great success. Again, the success of the dunya and the success of the akhirah. This season of mercy that's just ended, this season of forgiveness, and the season of righteousness and piety, is the most important of these seasons throughout the year. But it's not the only one. It's the most important but not the only season in which Allah Ta'ala further widens and opens the doors of mercy and forgiveness. I say further because Allah's doors of mercy are always open. The doors of forgiveness are always open. They don't only open in Ramadan. But they further open in Ramadan. And so it's one of many of such seasons and throughout the year Allah Ta'ala further widens these doors so that we get a greater opportunity to come closer to Him so that we can prepare ourselves for the days that come and then in between those seasons so we have for example Ramadan we have for example the first days of the Hijjah another very you know important and noble time we have also Ashura and Muharram generally, and so on. These uh, periods of time throughout the year are constantly coming up for us to take advantage of. But in between, we want to keep up some of what we started in those seasons, not to let go completely. Not to let go completely. And it's not wrong to do less outside Ramadan than to do in Ramadan. Even the Prophet ﷺ did that. As Aisha says, كان النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم إذا دخل العشر الأواخر when the ten last days of Ramadan entered, شد مكزره. You know, he tied himself together, got himself ready, got himself in, in the mold. وأحيا ليله and brought his night to life. He kept it alive with worship and prayer and reciting the Quran. And he would even wake up his family so that they could join in the worship. So it's not wrong to do more in Ramadan than to do outside of Ramadan. That's very natural. But it is problematic if after Ramadan we drop below to a level that is not really acceptable to a level in which committing sin you know, becomes normal again and routine to a level in which we're even neglectful about obligations whether those obligations are obligations towards Allah or towards others around us and so one of the signs as the scholars rahimahullah said that Allah has accepted for us our worship is that we move on to other righteousness, other piety, once we complete it. فَإِذَا فَرَقْتَ فَانْصَرْ 
Once you complete your ibadah, then move on to the next. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ encouraged us not to slow down too much after Ramadan and straight away encouraged us to continue this good routine of fasting at least that we've started. And we all know that once we've gotten into the routine of fasting, fasting is no longer as difficult as it seems. So whilst we, our body and our mind is still used, used to that fasting routine, that's an opportunity for us to take advantage of. And the Prophet says, as reported by Muslim, Man saw Ramadan, whoever fasts Ramadan, thumma atba'ahu, sitta min shawwal, then follows it up with six days of shawwal, fasting six days of shawwal, kana kasiyami dahu. Then it's as though he's fasted for a year or for a lifetime. Both translations are correct. Because if you do this every year, then it's like you're fasted, you fasted for a whole lifetime. And that fasting begins the day after Eid. So if someone is fasting today, there's no harm. If someone fasts tomorrow, there's no harm. They can start tomorrow. If someone wants to fast every Monday and Thursday, there's, there's no harm. The, a person can fast how they wish. And many of the Salaf used to like fasting straight after Eid, whilst they're still in that routine, and so that they don't give themselves an excuse later on to not fast and so on. <coughs> and this hadith is an authentic hadith reported by Imam Muslim and many, many other scholars of hadith. And, you know, those few scholars who questioned or had different opinions, then one of the leading scholars of hadith, Al-Fatih <coughs> Alawi, rahimahullah, has written a nice essay in which he's shown the importance and the authenticity of fasting six days after shawwal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, forgive our sins and accept from us our actions. Alhamdulillahi wahdahu wa sallallahu wa sallam ala man la nabiyya ba'dah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsani ila yawm al-deen amma ba'd. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Man sama Ramadan, whoever fasts Ramadan, thumma atba'ahu, and then follows it up with six days of shawwal. That means it is better to first make up the missed days of Ramadan before we fast the six days of shawwal. It is better to first make up any days that we've missed in Ramadan and then to fast six days in Shawwal. And if someone's unable to do so because they broke too many fasts, they missed six days or seven days, okay, due to uh, menstruation, or they were traveling for a period of time, or they were ill for a few days and so on, and so they struggle to make up the fasts of Ramadan before fasting Shawwal, then they can fast six days of Shawwal and then whenever Fasting in Ramadan, making up those days becomes easier, they can do so. Brothers and sisters, coming close to Allah and worshipping Allah and constantly being in routine of remembering Allah, that's not just something that we do because we're Muslims or something we do because we're supposed to or something we do only because we want Allah's reward in the Akhirah. These are all important reasons. But it's something we do because we need it. We need it. We are in a time, our relatives are in a time, our friends, our children, those around us, all of us are in a time where we are facing trial after trial, challenge after challenge, fitna after fitna, doubt after doubt, struggle after struggle. These things need strong spiritual preparation. We can't just be uh, loose Muslims and then expect to stand firm at times of difficulty. It doesn't work. And also we can't expect that the same comfort that we're living in today is going to continue forever. People who face uh, all sorts of hardships that we're all aware of around the world, many of them were living in total comfort and freedom and relaxation at one point, And then things just arose. And that's why it's obligatory upon us to always be prepared for anything that might happen, anything that might face us, anything that might face our children. And that preparation needs two things, sound knowledge and strong Iman. Sound knowledge and strong Iman. That strong Iman and that sound knowledge, one of its 
the best ways of achieving it is to be in that regular ibadah, that regular worship. So we want to view worship in that way as well. There is reward in the akhirah, but it's like a fuel. It's like an energy, it's like a weapon to keep us going throughout our lives, to help us to face any doubts, to help us to face any challenges, to help us face hardships, so that we don't end up being from those who, at the tiniest struggle, we flicked out of the way and our Iman suffers and our Iman struggles and our connection to Allah suddenly just shatters. That's, that's what we don't want. And this is why before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent prophets, He would prepare them first. As you guys know, before the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa received revelation, He was spending a lot of time in khalwa, in seclusion on His own, remembering Allah, worshipping Allah. He was already a person of good character. He was already a person of discipline. And they have that special support from Allah, of course. As Allah said to Musa alayhi salam, before he became a prophet, so that you could be brought up on my eye. On my eye meaning, under my watchful eye, under my care, under my help, under my support. And so the prophets were ready to face violence, to face abuse, to face belying, to face all sorts of hardships. And so therefore we need that same preparation in order to face similar challenges and be prepared for them, lest Allah have mercy on us and allow us to get through this world safely and to reach Him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with us. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barik ala nabiyyina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma afidna wa hamna wa afina wa afu anna. Allahumma aslih fasada qulubina. Allahumma ati nufusana taqwaha wa zakiha. Ta khayru man zakaha. Ta waliuha wa mawlaha. Allahumma aslih ikhwalina fi kulli makan ya Rabbil Alameen. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify our hearts and to fill our hearts with iman. And to keep us firm in the face of challenges and fitna. And to keep our worship and closeness to him consistent. And to support our brothers and to help them overcome those who are oppressive and their enemies in all places. Alhamdulillah, Ya Rabbil Alameen.